<laughs> okay. We're good. We're live here. Um, this is Jackie and Bobby Angel here with Greg and Barbara Bataro. Hey guys. Hi. So a bit of a time zone difference. We're in the Pacific time. You're on the East Coast, correct? Yes. Yeah, we're we're post putting kids to bed. How about you guys? <laughs> They're running around in a yard. We haven't had dinner yet, so we're <laughs> there is some supervision. Yeah. No, we got grand all the grand most of the grandparents watching the kids. So. Yeah. So nice. there, may, there may be wailing and gnashing of teeth, but <laughs> just pay no attention to that sound yeah, in the back. Pay no attention to that noise there. <laughs> So Dr. Uh, Gregory and I had a, a great conversation where um, a while ago where we were highlighting his book, uh, The Mindful Catholic. And since then, you guys have written a second book we wanted to highlight and just talk about trying to parent um, and with it, with a prayerful mindset. That's kind of going to be what we're, we're riffing on and wherever else the conversation goes. But quick intros here. Um, I'm from Florida, from the very strange land of Florida. Um, <laughs> went through college and then eventually the seminary um, for diocesan priesthood and along the way made several connections that would bear fruit later in life including some guys that were with the cfrs which is your connection there so i feel like we're of the same cloth <laughs> just different time eras i guess that's right moved out, moved out here to california when i met a, a blonde well you moved out here for the blondes for the blonde yeah god, god made it very clear um, and I've been blessed to work at a uh, all boys Catholic high school uh, ever since. I'm in my seventh or eighth year now. So, yeah, and I'm Jackie, and yeah, we've had. I, I speak around the country, and I also am a composer and songwriter, worship leader, and uh, I'm glad when Bobby gets to travel with me. And but we have three little kiddos, so yeah, I try to not travel as much as I used to. Yep. <laughs> and yeah, we speak about God's love, about theology of the body, about anything we can talk about so yeah all right while you guys introduce awesome. yourselves tell us about tell us about you sure so i'm uh i'm a psychologist i happen to be a catholic psychologist and so uh a lot of the work that i do is centered around that integration of the faith with uh the practice of psychology and therapy so uh, i'm always exploring ways to help people kind of really sort of bring their spiritual life into their regular human life and and kind of live out of that faith um, I have uh, a practice called the Catholic Psych Institute. We have 10 therapists and six offices, different parts of the country. And um, we're, we're trying to fill the need of the church, which is ever present. And so we're, we're always facing that challenge of how to grow and how to carry on the work that we're doing. Um, and at the same time, I'm also a father. And uh, my, my most important vocation of being a husband and father here. And so my wife and I are are raising our four and soon to be fifth child. Super soon, super soon. Like two weeks, <laughs> two weeks from today. Oh my gosh! Congratulations. Um. So I'm Greg's wife, Barbara, and uh, like he said, we have uh, about to have our fifth kid under six, um, in the next couple weeks. Well, so, then. um, he's integrating like psychology and the faith out of the house and I'm trying to do it in the house or we would all be completely mad. Yes. So um, when this book opportunity came up, it was like almost immediate, like this is definitely the direction. The Holy Spirit was like, this is where you need to go with it. And um, it was so much fun and it was actually really quick and kind of easy to do together. And uh, I think our family has really benefited from, from having that. Awesome. So speaking of that, I have your book. <laughs> Very, nice. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Sitting like a saint, Catholic mindfulness for kids. Could you guys talk about the process of writing that and and, and why you wrote it? Yeah, why you wrote it. Yeah. I've 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 read it to my daughters, who are four and a half and three. Yeah, and they kept running in circles around me. <laughs> <laughs> so the sitting, the sitting part we're working on, but we can't even get to that. So sitting like a saint is <laughs> if you get the saint part, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, like like saint, running like a saint. You could be yeah. doing somersaults like a saint. There's a there's a whole series really. Yeah. Yeah. Tantrums like saints. Yeah. Hey, we could write that book for it. 
these sequel ideas coming out. But could, could, you guys, could you guys talk about the process? Like how, yeah. yeah how about? Yes, to back up first, we, you know, when we first talked about the book, uh, the first book was The Mindful Catholic and and um, sort of a more integrated, yeah, that's the one right there, the more integrated sort of in, uh, work that I've done in my practice with adults and then also teaching groups and teaching an online course is, is this idea of bringing um, essentially what it comes down to is bringing abandonment to divine providence and the stability that comes from trustful surrender into our emotional lives and connecting the dots so that we don't just like saying on one hand, we trust God, but then on the other hand, we're flipping out all the time. Like we actually have to bring those two things together. And so the mindful Catholic is like that how to manual of putting into practice emotionally, cognitively, mentally, intellectually, what you believe by faith. And as, as we work through like normal adult situations, whether it's like stress about work or stress about family, marriage life, family life, people are like, well, does that really work? Like, do, can, can this actually be effective? And then they test it and it, it works. Except the one piece is always hanging out there, which was a, sort of a loose end was, well, how can I do, use this with my kids? What can I, you know, should my kids join the course with me? Do I read this book to my kids? They're like, well, it's kind of an adult book. So really we do need to translate this into something that can be used by kids in their language. And so we started to do that actually ourselves with our kids. And we were just kind of like, you know, sort of riffing on different things to do. And, you know, she came up with ideas and I came up with ideas and we were trying to like make that all work. And then eventually uh, talking with the publisher and then just the kind of thing just grew organically till we realized like this actually needs to be a book. And she was using, um, you had, what was it? Sitting like a frog or you had some other secular yeah. material. There was, there was an awesome little secular book, but it happens to be for kids who are a little bit older. So they have a bunch of audio exercises. Um, but you know, like our kids are all under six years old. So like, unless it's an audio book that they're interested in and it's telling them a story, they don't care at all. And so a lot of our like practice with them at home is like, sit down, take a breath, take another breath. And, um, that was working great. And so they were used to it. And so when we started sort of kind of sketching this book out, um, we just had it on note paper and we were like, let's just test it on them and see what happens. And they were like begging for the exercises. Like, can we start our day with um, with Pope John Paul II? And like, let's have a great day. And they'd be laying on their bellies and like, today I'm gonna be generous, you know? And then you have to like remind them, like remember when you just stole your sister's toy and you said you were gonna be generous? Like, <laughs> so um, it really kind of came about. It was uh, like almost out of necessity that um, we wrote it and I said, if nobody ever likes this but us like it's so great to have it because i really just wanted it for our family so um i hope that other people benefit from it in the way that we did or that we do um we did try to read it with our 18 month old the other day and she kind of just did the same thing like ran around screaming getting in everyone's face so she's not allowed to do any mindfulness <laughs> <laughs> For, for the, the, those under two, they can just use yeah. tranquilizers. So. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That's right. Yeah, nap time is her practice. Right. <laughs> I love. I love how again you there was a you want it was just like for our family and this local practice and how often like devotions and other stuff are just they come out of a small thing that then God calls forth to be bigger mm -hmm. and for other people to use and capitalize on. So it's great that you weren't like oh how do i make a buck here it was like yeah you know, like there should be there should be something for you know if it's helping to de-stress and bring a more centeredness and deepening of prayer to adults you know shouldn't there be a kid equivalent jackie's seen again the maturity of children mm -hmm. especially in prayer like praying over people like the holiness of kids is possible and we don't always give them credit for it like yeah. there's a pastor that says little kids don't have a junior Holy Spirit. They have the whole Holy Spirit, mm. uh, which I love. I love it. So true. Like uh, I was at a conference recently where 
<laughs> it was teaching about the spiritual gifts and spiritual charisms. And there was like an elementary school track. It was so awesome. And so then they brought the elementary school track into the adult track and the little kids were praying over the adults and the adults were like, pew, like, <laughs> they were wow. like I, I mean, I saw a little girl praying over a priest and she was like giving him words of knowledge. I was dying. I was, I was, singing, I was singing worship and this little girl was just praying over this. I was like, oh my gosh, that's true because they don't have a junior Holy Spirit. They have the full Holy Spirit. But again, we, um, yeah, I mean, I work with high schoolers, junior high students and I mean, we have a four and a half year old and I'm like, I know what my four and a half year old can, she, she knows a lot of the Bible, she can tell you Bible stories. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we, we talk about junior high students as if they like, oh, well, junior high students can't do this. I'm like, my four year old can do it. You know, right. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't give enough credit. Now, granted, kids, I mean, when they're under the age of reason, yeah. they're, they, they're, they're under they're, <laughs> yeah, there's squirreliness and uh, they're nuts, but and tantrums. I mean, I'm sure there's tantrums over the age of reason, but we don't know because we don't have those kids. Yet, so. Well, we throw tantrums. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, are stuck in an airport. Yeah, like, can't get off the airplane. We throw tantrums. Look, look no further. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I think that I think you're totally right. I think that they're so beautifully spiritually deep, and it's shocking sometimes the stuff that comes out of their mouth and what makes sense in their head, um, the Holy Spirit is totally talking to them. And it's like, it's so incredible. Like even the things that our kids, you know, if especially if they have a little motivation to do something sweet, but it's really like from their heart. Um, and so being around them, like it was so clear what, what would really strike them as something exciting or, you know, something to catch their attention. But a lot of I think a lot of the book also just comes from the fact that like having this many little kids, it, you're just like constantly immersed in their mindfulness because they are just about the present moment all the time. Yeah. And when they're really spiritual, you're like, it just sort of, it just sort of came up. Like they're going to love, you know, Joan of Arc because you're standing like a soldier. Right. And we have like a three-year-old who's like going to protect the house. If anything happens, from the monsters, right? It's like, it's beautiful. Um, so I don't know, we've we've had a great time with it. Abby, yeah, Abby, our, our older daughter, loved the Joan of Arc one when we got to it. So, and the illustrations are great too. They're beautiful, how much that is, is St. Francis of CC. Yeah, we had, a, we had a, a guy who, actually another CFR connection, we had yeah. a guy who was in my class at, when I was with the Friars, he was in the same class. And uh, since he has also left, and he has an awesome ministry as well. His name is Michael Corsini. And uh, he's got a ministry. I think it's Michael Corsini Arts. And he paints beautiful paintings. He's a great musician. He does a lot of worship leading and Super talented. Um, just like all, all around talent. And um, so, yeah, he was totally stoked about this uh, project. And yeah, there's Joan of Arc right there. <laughs> so pretty. So we're really blessed to have him on board with the project. Now that you say that, I think I've met him before. You probably right. have. He, he, make, he makes uh, a lot of the rounds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Does he also do, like, chapels and stuff? Does he do any, like, art? Yeah. Stuff? Does he design? Yeah, he recently did something at, um, I think, at Montclair State University. He did a chapel there that I saw in a bunch of places in social media that was kind of blasted out. So you might okay. have seen that. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. So you can get the book on Amazon, I assume, or where else? Yeah. It launches, uh, it launches on, um, what is it? Monday is April 1st. I think so. And, um, you can get it on Amazon. I think it's, it's published by Matthew Kelly's, uh, publishing arm there. So I think you can get it at, at right at D dynamic Catholic. Okay. Nice. Um, but yeah, Amazon's probably just as easy. Awesome. So, Catholic Psych Institute's grown quite a bit. Which, yeah. <laughs> which is, I'm sure, exhausting, but a beautiful blessing of like speaking to the need of the time. I, yeah. I have referred people on Instagram. I keep giving them your website. <laughs> and I'm telling you, they, uh, hopefully you've gotten like people, <laughs> more people like emailing you or whatever, because I keep telling, because that's traveling around and speaking to high schoolers and young adults. I mean, the two biggest things I hear all the time and I is depression and anxiety. And so the fact that you guys do Skype sessions, right? You do Skype sessions. Yeah, um, we do online therapy. Yeah, because 
uh, to find a Catholic psychologist in your region is pretty difficult. And so the, the fact with the internet and to be able to Skype, that is awesome. So I posted your website on my Instagram and I've had so many people direct message me being like, thank you because I've been struggling with anxiety or depression or, you know, so tell us more about that, that you're. Yeah, uh, I, well, first of all, I appreciate that. That's really great. And um, yeah, it's, you know, when I, when I first started the practice and, and I kind of left and was ready to sort of get out into the world, we were just getting married. We're coming up on uh, seven years, 2012. We got married. I started the practice. We're kind of starting fresh and everything. And, um, you know, I, I had to decide, am I going to sort of like be subtle with my Catholicism and I practice or do I kind of go all in? And so in praying and discerning, just realized like I was a CFR, like I was kind of all in and that's not, my personality. Not when we were married. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> right before we got married, before I knew Barbara. <laughs> Um, so I, I just decided to go all in with the practice and call it the Catholic psych Institute. And it does limit me in terms of the, the people I work with, but in a really beautiful way. And I love it. And all the challenges that we have are awesome challenges, like growing and figuring out how to stretch. Like I wasn't taught any business. We have to figure out like how to build a business, how to grow a business, all that stuff along the way. Um, but now it's basically, you know, connections within the Catholic community, because what we do is a very deep integration of Catholic anthropology. And so it's not just that we happen to be Catholic and we happen to be therapists, but we're actually creating a model for how to be thoroughly Catholic in the practice of psychotherapy. And so that's what these integrations, these fruits are sort of springing out of like Catholic mindfulness or mindfulness for kids. And there's a whole dimension to the sitting like a saint that it's not really written into the pages, but in terms of how we put it together, probably heard of attachment theory. So attachment theory is this really important aspect of parenting and understanding uh, psycho-spiritual development of children. Well, there are certain aspects of that that are really beautifully integrated and interwoven with the anthropology and what the church teaches about the family and about marriage and about raising children. And so like all those little things are, are really intentionally woven into the work that we do. So anybody in the world could come to us and benefit as long as they're human because we're tapping into human anthropology. But when we work with people who already have like the, the sort of groundwork laid a little bit with the faith, it's just, it explodes. And you realize like, why, why is there so much anxiety and depression? Like there's, there shouldn't be. If, if we really believe that Christ conquered death, that the tomb was empty, that everything is overcome at the end of the day, then what the heck are we stressed about? What are we actually anxious about or depressed about? There shouldn't be potty training, you know, that kind of <laughs> potty training should not be stressing us out. <laughs> if Jesus conquered death, <laughs> we could conquer potty, potty training and then things are going to be okay. <laughs> but like, so learning how to weave that stuff together and then create like an effective applied psychology where we can help people get there in their faith life, in their emotional lives, that's what gives me a lot of joy. So that's that's basically what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that's how we're growing really fast. Yeah, I like what you said in um, your the, the Mindful Catholic book is that this has helped a lot of people with, again, the depression and, and a lot of like you were saying like 50% of people with major depressive disorder, mind this has helped them a lot. Um, and then even to say like, and, and for other people as uh, along with medication, um, because oh, yeah. I, yeah, I have some friends who, and obviously depression comes from a lot of different things. It comes from obviously maybe hormones or some, you know, situational things. So it's from all different factors, but, um, people like I have a couple friends who, um, hormonally, I had a friend who every time she PMS, she was suicidal. Like every time of the month, like her hormones are so out of whack, you know? Yeah. So again, I love that being Catholic isn't anti-science. It's not anti-psychology. Right. Cause I actually, I minored in psychology. I loved it. I, I thought about doing marriage and family therapy, but that was not the call God called me on. Um, but again, I try to tell people like, listen, go, like, God wants us to be healthy and holy, go to therapy. Like if you need to, talk, you know, if you need medication for something, if you, again, if you're bipolar, if you're like, we're not anti medication, but again, that there are some things that can help alongside that or, um, yeah. That's the other half of it too. It's like, it's, it's not even just about not being depressed or not being anxious. It's about not making it worse when we do have issues to accept. 
So like there were some criticisms against mindfulness that said, uh, the Catholic mindfulness that said, well, you, you're trying to pretend like there's no suffering or you can just sort of make all the suffering go away. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the opposite. The whole point of Catholic mindfulness and abandonment to divine providence is acceptance of the path that God is allowing for you, accepting God's providence. So if God allows there to be some sickness or illness where maybe there is a hormonal deficiency or maybe there is some imbalance or maybe there is some difficulty where you need medication, a lot of times it's because people are so self-judgmental, they don't accept that about themselves or their, their path at this particular point in their life that they're actually making it worse. Whereas you can actually reduce the level of anxiety and depression by accepting the fact that maybe there's some anxiety and depression, or maybe you do need medication or therapy or, or whatever it is, or maybe this is going to be for some time that this is a, a cross that you're going to be offered to unite to Jesus and, and, and actually benefit from. So it's a great point there that, you know, this is, this is not sort of like this polarization between faith and science or faith and psychology. But this is a way that we can really, truly, deeply integrate it all together. I was just thinking on the acceptance note. Um, you were, I don't know if you were out at a talk. You were, he was in the city the other night. And the kids um, were upset because he left when they started taking a nap. And then he wasn't going to be back until after they got home. And so Francesca, who's four and a half, I put them to bed. And they were all like, we really miss dad. And I'm like, I understand he's been gone like two hours gonna be fine he'll be back like probably before you actually fall asleep but everything's fine and then I'm you know like in the laundry room and I hear the, a little door open and I'm like here she comes and she said I'm just too sad to sleep <laughs> and I said okay what would Greg do <laughs> and I said you're really sad and she said I'm I'm so sad that he's not here I can't sleep and I said it's okay to be sad and, and I want you to say, it's okay to be sad. And she's like, it's okay to be sad. I said, it's okay to be so sad that you feel that you can't sleep. And she said, it's, it's okay that I'm sad and I can't sleep. But it was unbelievable because we did it. She totally accepted that like, it was fine to miss her dad. It was fine to feel like her feeling. And then I gave her a hug and I said, are you ready to go back to sleep? And she said, yeah. And I thought, it worked. <laughs> I can't believe it worked. And I was like, okay, good night. <laughs> Greg came home and I was like, I did it. I really, I like, but it's true, right? Instead of just saying like, you know, shut it down or, you know, take care of it or whatever. She totally came around to like, this is an okay feeling to have. Like it might not be okay to not go back to bed or to yell and scream about it, but it was totally okay just to feel that. Um, amazing. That's funny because my growing up, yeah, it's like I'm sure maybe some of our parents like growing up, like ah, stop whining, go to bed, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Get over it. Stop feeling your emotions, and yeah. you know, do and it's funny because I read another book about toddlers and how to deal with toddlers. I'm like, gosh. Um, but oh. it was kind of it was kind of saying like it's okay for them to feel mm -hmm. like you can validate their feelings. Like yeah, it's okay to be sad. You know, it's okay. I know you're feeling, yeah, it's so true that when you actually validate them, <laughs> instead of telling them to stop it, you know, which is hard for me to do because that's how I grew up. Just ah, stop having emotions. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's, you know, that's one of the cool things about doing these books is coming at it from a couple of different angles, knowing that parents are going to be the ones reading these books to their kids. I mean, that's how I grew up. That's how she grew up. So yeah. it takes a lot of work to change those patterns for and yourself. get used to something else for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. When we put it into the book and have a parent reading to their kids, whatever feeling you're feeling right now is okay that it's your feeling and it's okay to feel angry and it's okay to feel, you know, like even if I'm reading, even when I'm reading that to my kids, I wrote it and I, you know, and, and it's like, I'm reading it and it's like, it's okay to feel, yeah, it is. It's okay to feel angry, <laughs> you know, and like, it's, it's, it's like self-teaching. It's teaching the parents how to relate. And, and, and how to manage those emotions at the same time. So it's a really cool thing you get to do with a children's book because it's kind of for the kids, but it's really for the parents since they're the ones reading it. And then it's creating the connection between the two at the same time. That was, that was your insight, you know, when, when yeah. we wrote it. No, yeah, totally. Especially, you know, whenever you're totally overwhelmed by all the army of children 
that are so little and completely unreasonable. Um, and you're like, like sometimes I'm like, okay, guys, I think we need to reset. And what I mean is like, I need to reset, sit down. <laughs> like We're doing this right now. And, um, and then I'm like, oh, I feel so much better. And even if they're still like crazy, I realized like I did it. I started my day over and mm -hmm. like, I can now be the parent that they need me to be. Um, and I'm not like so triggered because they know exactly what to do as <laughs> wonderful as they are. They're really good at it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's been, and I can't pick up the mindful Catholic all the time and like, <laughs> and read through it when I'm like immersed in the yeah. kids. So a quick exercise is actually like super helpful. So that's a good point that feelings, like even in our Catholic faith, feelings aren't sins. Like our thoughts and our actions yeah. can be sinful, but our feelings, the things that immediately arise within right. us, obviously our thoughts and our actions. So, so question, okay, so you guys are going to give us some advice. Like our, our girls are struggling with sharing right now. They hate sharing. I mean, it is, mom, she won't share with me all the time. So how do we, nope. how do we validate their feelings? <laughs> Yes, it's sad, you know, when you want to give a toy away. Like, how do we validate their feelings, but also help them in their thoughts and actions? <laughs> yeah, I would say, I mean, we're right in the same spot. And it's tough because I, at the same time, I don't know if this is your problem, but our problem too is like, we have like a couple different conflicting principles that are all like thrown in there at the same time. So on one hand, we're trying to teach them autonomy and like stewardship. And it's okay, like this is your thing, so you take care of it. And then teaching somebody else, like you can't just go take something if it belongs to somebody else. And then at the same time, you're teaching them, okay, but always be willing to share and give of yourself. <laughs> Hold nothing back for yourself. For, like, <laughs> make a gift of yourself. <laughs> you know, make a gift. So you're like, whoa, like this is private, chaos. Private property. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Generosity. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Right. Solidarity, subsidiarity. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, or, you know, I'd say number one is to like step back and like be really clear on like which principle you're teaching at this moment and, and, and just verbalize the principles that I think that's really helpful. And then, um, well, we always say we're like, you know, you really want that toy. And that's really hard that you really want that toy and someone else is playing with it right now. And especially when it comes to like the young, if you know, someone older has it and the younger person wants it. Um, and then I don't know if this is correct, but somehow I, I'm like, you know, Elijah, your brother's only three. Is there a way that you could show him like you really want to play with him? Cause he's not able to like, tell you how badly he wants to play with you. He just wants to take your toy. And so, you know, kind of work on that angle a little bit. Often there's like, I don't really want this anyway. Here you go. Or why don't you come build with me instead? Um, and then sometimes it's like, no, <laughs> and that's the answer. And then I'm like, your brother said, no, that's really hard, huh? <laughs> so <laughs> and, and allowing for that freedom, because I think even at the youngest age, you really have to be careful not to, um, manipulate or sort of crush the freedom that they have. And even if they make mistakes with their freedom, it's still really important that they grow into it. So usually we'll also try to set up a lot of reward mm -hmm. for making the right choice and withhold the reward, you know, for, for making a selfish choice and also put language around it. So not, not by not being shaming. It's another thing you have to be careful about. There's like so many, so many landmines mm -hmm. to watch out stepping into. Right. <laughs> but and, and I always tell parents and I remind myself and my wife, like intentions do count. And like, as long as we're, <laughs> as long as the intention is we're coming from a good place, like all the little mistakes and foibles that we make uh, can be covered over. And through therapy, obviously. And, <laughs> yeah, right. Therapy always works. Wait a minute. It's a of therapy. <laughs> Like but I, you know, allowing for the mistakes to be made, and then, but when when they make a good choice, like just giving a lot of solid affirmation and uh, rewarding that good behavior with the with the positive attention, and then when, like I said, when they don't, then just say, you know, this is this is not the best version of yourself. We use that Matthew Kelly language, like right from the time the they're time. like two years old. All Actually, I think I just said it to Avila. She's eighteen months. So I we're think like, you're saying it to the baby in my tummy. I think <laughs> all the time. Yeah. 
<laughs> Don't give mommy a hard time. Be the best version of yourself, you All little preborn infant. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's 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 not going to look perfect. It's going to look really messy, but that's that's okay. You know, it's 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 like the Israelites in the desert. Like it it looks really messy, but God was not an imperfect parent. You know, he he let them make their mistakes. He corrected them when they did. And forty years was tough. That was tough. That was a punishment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think it's really, really great, especially when someone just like organically does something really sweet and they get really rewarded for it. Um, like we have our little um, Lenten crown with the toothpicks and, you know, so they, when they do something really selfless or they help out, they get their little thorn, which I find hilarious. I'm like, you get a thorn. Um, but, you know, when they do it and they see that they get that little reward, then all of a sudden everyone else follows suit. So I think Francesca did something the other day, like she just gave up like half of her dessert to someone and she just did it out of the goodness of her heart. And then all of a sudden, like everyone was just like pushing all of their, you know, like Oreo cookies to, and I'm like, oh, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> like you be generous, but you don't have to like, you don't have to kill yourself about it. Like, you know, so, but it's really sweet. Like they see that and they want so badly to like do the right thing. But I think their emotions and everything just kind of gets in the way. Like all of us, um, at the end of the day, like they're just trying their best. I think like, like everybody. <laughs> I, I mean, I go back to again, like, I love how detached you are, Dr. Greg, when it comes to the whole mindfulness thing. And, and like, you've got, I've heard you say, if this word is a stepping stone or is a, is a stumbling block for you in embracing this methodology, just insert practicing the presence of God or abandoning yourself to divine providence because God who is the present moment is here. And the more you are mindful and considerate of it. So again, if, if there's, you know, you're wary of stuff from the East, again, I, I say, read the book, read mindful Catholic cause you address all that, but how you said it's so much a Christian anthropology, like the incarnation, is God becoming man. And we're not, really, this is the work of undoing Descartes, like, I think therefore I am, and we have this split between the body and the soul today. And this is this is trying to bring it back together, of like, you're not just a soul trapped in a, trapped body. In a body, you're not just a body with this, you know, we're not just atoms <laughs> all colliding and that's it. Like, it's really like the work of, I am physical and yet spiritual, I'm emotional, and psycho is like the whole the whole shebang and when you're able to like bring them all back together that's whole and i dare say like well integrated whole, integrated yeah. like holiness like is uh, you're, you're ah I see what i did there you're like <laughs> moving the ball down the court there so right yeah, yeah that's, that's really at the heart of our mission for catholic psych institute in general like that's that really informs everything we do anything we do we, we i always apply it back to that principle because that i think is the greatest evil and and um sort of error of our culture and it leads us down all these paths whether it's like the super religious you know uber sort of you know all the way to that far right or if it's like the relativistic culture in, in the in that you know kind of leftist sort of idea but in the middle is where we find jesus and that is it is incarnational and that's exactly what it is, which is so beautiful. And it's like way more beautiful than we could imagine because it's through his incarnation. Like he, he sanctifies normal, simple human family life. And I love John Paul II's, uh, he, he, he writes on St. Joseph and, and uh, Redemptoris Custos. And he talks about the little family, the little home in Nazareth. And, you know, just thinking about how, like God, whatever God did is sanctified. So God nursed at the breast. So breastfeeding, it's not just like a, a, like a crunchy, you know, like, breast oh, is this best. is like breast is best, like, you know, a liberal agenda thing. Like, no, it's actually sanctified. Like God did this. If God was to exist in our world, he would exist as an infant who nurses at a breast. He did. That That's actually what happened. So when we look at a child breastfeeding, it's like, oh, wow, like this is holy ground. We're watching something that God does. And then, you know, think about that with poverty, just living in poverty. That's something that God does. 
when we look at work, like that's what God decided to do, like working and then being next to his father and like sanctifying the work of a, of a father's hands and providing and protecting for his family. So all these dimensions of like how approachable holiness actually is to every man and woman, every normal, you know, ordinary person is just mind blowing. So like, that's why I love this stuff because it's like, you know, bringing in, sorry, I have the book over here too. So bringing in like, this is the messiness of life. In fact, I don't know if you saw, but on the back cover, we did, we had, they asked us to put up this photo. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this was our Christmas photo from. Like, it's not a nice, clean, everyone is. Yeah, yeah so we, I'm mean, like, we, out of like 4,000 pictures, we probably got two or three that were a snapshot of like, everybody's looking like totally perfect. And there's like, why would we do that? That's so dumb. Like, that's not us. This is actually what life looks like. Yeah, that's literally not us. We had a friend that photoshopped. <laughs> yeah, out of like the thousands of photos, they had one perfect one, but the baby's head was turned. So they literally photoshopped his head looking in the one picture. <laughs> yeah, and, and we have a plenty of ours that are like that too. But we, you know, for this one in particular, is like this, I, the whole point is like, we want this to be real life because it's actually, God loves us in our real life and actually wants us to grow holy through our real life. And that's, that's like the normal life and the, the stuff that is just the potty training and the Yeah, we're not like preaching. And, we're, we're, we're not preaching. We're trying to figure out how like best not to drown. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people doing the same thing. Um, and so, you know, like we read about it, we talk about it. And I think um, anything that we can give back that we've learned is super helpful, hopefully. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're benefiting, and I pray so many other families will. Um, so as we kind of end the conversation here, any other, like, closing thoughts or things you'd want to lay down for any parents that are overwhelmed or or anyone in need of this message? You know, I think just in general, a, a couple messages that I like to just sort of promote is, again, like, it's the problem is not usually that parents don't love their kids enough. And there's so much self blame and self judgment. And, you know, when, when kids are acting up, they're misbehaving or when there's actual problems at school, behavioral issues, all this stuff, just our inclination is just to blame ourselves. And uh, at like a really fundamental level of identity and whether we're talking about our own spiritual growth or our marriages or our, our raising our kids, we always have to come back to this fundamental truth of our identity that we're loved first, that we exist as beings who are loved. And if we actually tap into that emotionally, intellectually, along with the spirituality of that, like all of a sudden things open up and, and problems are solved that you thought were insurmountable before. And that, I think that's the lie of the devil mm -hmm. to, to throw us off our game because he doesn't want us to know that we're actually loved already before we did anything. And if he's throwing us off our game, then everything gets thrown off its game. But if we return back to that original truth of our identity being planted in the, the total gratuitous, 100% overflowing love of God, then we become channels of that love and it affects everything else around us. Yeah. And when you're able to, when you really believe that and you really know it, then, and you're able to be peaceful, then that peace, like, opens up like he said the answers start to really come because you're able to really think about the situation and know that like you're not bad the situation might be tough but in the end like when you when you're able to sit with peace um i think that everything sort of can kind of fall into place awesome your book sitting like a saint catholic mindfulness for kids I like that was a very radio, Bobby <laughs> Bada's radio voice today. Hello, I'm Mike Rowe. <laughs> Welcome to Dirty Jobs. <laughs> the book on Amazon or the Anna Catholic website. Thank you guys so much for being willing to sit and riff. And if you're not, again, helps to, again, it always helps to talk to other parents that are in the mess to be like, okay, good, we're not alone. And we'll do this every week so that Bobby and I can get free therapy. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, we really appreciate what you guys are doing, too. I know yeah. you're, you're both incredibly busy. 
with family life and ministry and everything else. So just to take the time with us too here and have this conversation, this has been really blessed and we're really grateful. Thank you guys so much. Thank yeah. you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ending the broadcast.